thinking. Personally, now, I feel I would love to take Skip's example and use the same questions, send them out with every patient. Every time I send out a, a batch of LDN in the future, I would like to send out the same questionnaire and ask people to respond to it. Then we can collate our information, not just in the United States, but hopefully globally in the future. Okay, the main areas of use. My number one usage from the patients I have seen, and that's because, as a result, a direct result of Dr. Phil Boyd, is infertility in both males and females. It would be about 60% female, 40% male. Dysmenorrhea, all sorts of menstrual dysfunctions, pain. Um, uh, very successful use of it, that one. Um, it really seems to improve both regularity and pain involved in people with severe menstrual problems. MS, of course, but again, that's a population dynamic. I would have somewhere in the region of 50 to 70 current MS patients, including some in my own family. Um, autoimmune illnesses, I use that as a very broad generalization because there's quite a few. Rheumatoid arthritis was the one that I saw really dramatic results in several patients, all of whom had single, jo single joint type rheumatoid arthritis. It was almost osteoarthritis. But it wasn't, it was perhaps kind of rheumatoid arthritis, but one single joint seemed to be showing the major symptoms. Hypersensitivity, there's a doctor who specializes in that, a doctor Joe Fitzgibbon, he's quite a, a well known um, authoritarian on, on um, hypersensitivity and allergies. He's written several books, including one called Could It Be an Allergy? He's now beginning to use LDN quite a bit, with quite a lot of success as well. Chronic fatigue syndrome, which is no doubt it helps in a lot of those cases. Motor neuron disease, I have one patient who should be at this stage very disabled and isn't. And the two times he stopped taking LDN due to postal strikes or difficulty getting the drug, his symptoms worsened dramatically and very quickly and resolved again on restarting the drug. And fibromyalgia, the fibromyalgia patients I find tend to be hypersensitive to the drug. We often see doses of 0.5 milligrams at night. The strategic, <coughs> strategic problems are many. One I haven't mentioned there is professional jealousy. I've had eight inspections by different authorities this year from customs, uh, the Irish Medicine Board, who are the same as the FDA, tax inspectors, pharmacy inspectors, and you know, you know full well, no one else is getting these inspections. That, Part of the reason for these must be people ringing them up and saying, what's this guy at? Why can we not do it? Why are doctors sending their patients to him? But in Ireland, you cannot buy a prescription medicine from outside of Ireland. It's that, that, that's the easiest way to explain it. So the government has the right to impound that medicine at the customs. And even a pharmacist can't buy it. And I've had six or seven thousand capsules seized when I was buying it in before I started making it myself. <laughs> only to get them returned to me 14 months later. Completely useless. There are very few compounding pharmacies. Legislation, that's the same thing again. This drug is unlicensed for this use. It is, of course, licensed for the use in narcotics withdrawal. It's completely unlicensed for this condition. But that's not to say it, it shouldn't be used. I would say to any prescriber, if you feel you want to use it, use it. There's plenty of other drugs off label as, as we call it uh, as we call it here in the States. I see any amount of antihistamine has been used, overdose, I, I've seen any amount of steroids been used for unlicensed usage and, and similarly fertility agents, pro-fertility drugs that are supposed to be taken orally which are actually used intravaginally. Prescriber doubt is a huge issue. No matter how many articles you fax or write or mail or set on a doctor's desk, they won't be read. So they form an opinion only when the, the, when, the, when the issue presents itself on their table. A patient comes in looking for a drug, that puts them off to begin with. You know, hey, I'm not going to be told by a patient what I need to prescribe. So they get doubt, they get doubtful. And because they haven't heard of it, and because there's only one or two guys in the country doing it, immediately say, ah, oh, they're quacks, they're just looking to make big money, they're the medicine men. They're the medicine men, they've got a covered wagon, they're going to ship up and ship out tomorrow night. <laughs> many MS symptoms improved, and I mean many. The most obvious ones to me that people, people report on was the bladder control, bowel control, balance, hearing, and small bit of movements, the ability to grip and to move the feet. The motor neuron patient, one of them, improved quite dramatically. 
this worse than double joint stopping, as I'd always said. Fertility, fertility successes are a very hard thing to measure, they're very difficult thing. But two to four now, that's, that's 200 to 400 percent times more frequent than with other treatments prior to this, including the same drugs without the naltrexone. Fatigue improved in almost all the conditions I've mentioned previously. Was it because people were getting better sleep or because it was helping provide energy? Um, what, were they getting more comfort? Whatever it was, their fatigue levels dropped. They were getting a better night's sleep after the initial period of <laughs> Halloween fever, <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. I have nausea as number one. It's not that it's the most common reported syndrome, the, the side effect, but the most common one would be sleep disturbance. But the nausea, the people that suffer it, suffer it quite badly. They, 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 they complain that it, they don't have the constipation and diarrhea as well. But they do have quite bad, quite bad nausea. It does seem to help that they take it with food, a banana or something that binds the stomach, or milk maybe. But there are several patients who had to discontinue the drug because of nausea. They were not happy taking it. Every time they took it, they felt nauseous. And it could be my formula. Maybe we should, we should try sleep. It seems to be quite a bit better. <laughs> Um, headache, headache again is like the focal headache, semi migraine, one side. Reported sometimes, but not a lot. One patient reported a tiredness. Now, this patient suffered from chronic fatigue. She was very reactive towards drugs, and she said it made her very tired after taking the drug, but felt better overall. The exaggerated claims, a lot of people, this is, this is what I hear. This is, People ring me up and say, surely it can't be doing all this. You know, these are exaggerated claims. Surely the drug's not that good. We think it's pretty good. But I do think we all need to be aware in this room that we're, pre we're preaching to converts. You know, we're all converts here. We, most of us know about the drug and believe that it's very good. So we have to, we have to really listen to the negative side as well so that we aren't showing a, a bias that may be inborn in us. But I mean, when you listen to the lectures today, it's hard not to be biased. People talk about past experiences and stories, mainly prescribers, and this is the reason for not prescribing it. You know, I tried it once, but the patient got worse, so I never went near it again. You're always going to get some who don't improve, but there's always going to be, um, there's always going to be failed cases, unfortunately. The lack of understanding and the lack of knowledge is by far the most pervasive of the negative uh, attitudes we see towards it. Um, the perceived exaggeration is something I am very want to avoid. We're good at it here because we know it's very good. But if we sing too much, people will just cover their ears. It's, it's uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, repeated, r repeated stress disorder. You might get in a joint when you're on a marathon. Um, the, more, the more you talk about something, the more they don't want to hear about it. So it has to be subtle and well informed and scientific. The low usage rates of the drugs doesn't encourage its use. You know, it's a negative feedback as well. If, if there's not a lot of patients on it, or not a lot of prescribers talking about it, there's very few people willing to take up to take the risk. Everyone here is a risk taker. Anyone who decides to go on the drug, anyone who decides to dispense it, anyone who decides to prescribe it, we're all taking risks. We're sticking our necks out, but we know why. Sometimes you have to dare to achieve. There's the fear of the unknown, as I said already. I mentioned the exaggeration already, I won't dwell on it. Finally, I want to show you a picture I took a few weeks ago. Again, you wonder what, what the hell has this got to do with Naltrexone? <laughs> well, on the left of the picture, you'll see a very old method of using wind power, and on the right of the picture, you'll see a very new method of using wind power. Which just proves to me, and it should prove to everyone else, that you should never throw away the old. You should never think one thing is only used for one thing and that only. There are all, always new ways to develop energy, new ways to develop thinking. And there's two sides to every story. And I think we all have a lot to learn. I can continue to preach this message to the professionals that are involved in the treatment of who are, after all, very vulnerable patients. Thank you for your time.